I would like to welcome everyone to today's meeting and remind members that this meeting will be recorded. Can you please switch off mobile phones or put them to silent mode? We have two guests to observe the meeting today, Eleanor Gaw from the Scottish Police Authority and from the Scottish Fire and Rescue Board Chair Designate Kirsty Darwent, who is due to take up post in mid-December. There will be refreshments following the meeting and an opportunity for members to meet with Eleanor and Kirsty, and you're both very welcome. Um, Derek, could you provide the sedan and apologies, please? Thank you, Chairman. Morning, members. Eight members present. Two apologies, councillors Ferguson and Murray, with Ian Blake possibly joining us. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Derek. Um, now we move on to item two. Any declarations of interest? No, nope, thank you. Um, move on to item three. Police Fire and Rescue Subcommittee appointments to outside bodies. Uh, members will be aware that the Chair and Vice-Chair were appointed to the Police Scotland Dumfries and Galloway Continuous Improvement Group. A request has been received from the local commander, Gary Ritchie, for the Chair and the Vice-Chair to attend the Police Scotland Dumfries and Galloway Community Policing Group as the Continuous Improvement Group has now fulfilled its function. Both myself and Councillor Davis Stitt are grateful for the invitation from the local commander and feel these meetings will be beneficial to maintain and improving our community policing in Dumfries and Galloway. Are there any members who would ask, wish to ask any questions on these appointments? No, nope, thank you very much. So, moving on to decision, members are asked to note that Police Scotland Dumfries and Galloway Continuous Improvement Group has fulfilled its function and the invitation received for the Chair and Vice-Chair to attend Dumfries and Galloway Community Policing Group as detailed in paragraphs 361-362. Are uh, we agree to note that? Yes. And agree to appoint Chair and Vice-Chair of the Subcommittee to the Police Scotland Dumfries and Galloway Community Policing Group as detailed in paragraph 364. Okay, thank you. Um, before we move on to, uh, sorry, item four, Police Scotland um, Dumfries and Galloway local plan, six month performance update, 1st of April 2017 to 30th September 2017 report by Director of Communities. And before we move on to scrutiny of the police local plan, members will be aware of recent correspondence from the local commander on the deployment of armed policing and the use of tasers. I would like to ask the Gary to provide the meeting with an update on how this may affect our region and then members can ask questions. Gary. Oh, thanks very much, Chair. Um, as the Chair mentioned there, I, I think you'll have received the correspondence that uh, I, I sent out initially, plus an update specifically for for members of, of this committee on uh, the, um, the the proposed changes to the deployment for the armed officers who are already operating in the Dumfries and Galloway region. Um, I don't want to say too much, and I'm happy to, to, to leave it open to questions. The only thing I would say that is that I think this is a very, very positive development. Um, for the region. Um, it's something that myself and the other local commanders around the country have been pushing for for quite some time because the, the simple fact is that we have a number of assets operating here who are national assets um, in the area um, who, who were not deployable by me. Um, and it didn't help the communities other than the fact that it p provided some perhaps uh, mobile visibility um, it didn't help the officers themselves because a lot of the time they are they're driving about close to incidents that they could attend, um, but because of our policy as a force, they, they, they couldn't, and that was frustrating for them and for their colleagues. Um, and now th those those uh, obstacles have been removed, and as I say, I think that's, that's a positive and sensible move uh, in, in this environment. I understand that there's there's controversy about it. It's, uh, it's actually quite a big step for for police in Scotland, not just in Scotland, in the UK, um, to be more visible when they're at, when they're overtly armed, um, especially in, in more traditional communities like ours. Um, but I, I do feel that the environment's right. I do feel that we have debated this and engaged in this appropriately, 
Um, and I hope that uh, the members will agree with me as a, a positive step. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Uh, we'll open up to members' questions. Councillor Chatteris. Um, but is there, any ev is there any evidence that criminals are more likely to carry guns if they know that they, there is a greater number of policemen carrying guns? Um, I suppose the quick answer to that is, is no. Um, and, I, and I think that that probably comes from our um, experience across the UK over the last few years where the number of armed assets in the police has, has increased fairly dramatically. Um, what you haven't seen is, is a, a, a like increase in, in gun crime across the UK. Now, I don't have actual figures, councillor. I mean, it's something that I could get for you. Um, but I think if any evidence would, would probably show the contrary, that gun crime has actually fallen in the UK um, since that. I, I don't necessarily think that there's a, correl there's a direct correlation between, between the two. I think what we have in the UK is very effective gun control that's getting more effective year on year. Um, but I, so, I, so I, it, it's difficult to make a direct correlation, but uh, there's certainly no evidence to suggest that it has increased as a result of the police being armed. Councillor Lever. It's just a, a fundamental question. It's probably my naivety, but what is an armed response vehicle? How do you uh, actually define that? And are armed police or police bearing firearms, are they restricted to using the armed response vehicles or can they just generally use uh, police vehicles? An, an, armed, an armed response vehicle is a, is a vehicle which carries two uh, authorised firearms officers. Um, they are armed at all times uh, with sidearms and there's also uh, firearms in the car um, as well in, in, the, um, in, the, in the patrol car. So they are, that's the only cars they use, the only vehicles they use, and it's, uh, and it's only them that are, that are able to use it. Councillor Howe? Uh, not so much a, a, a question, just the, uh, somebody from a community policing background, I'm supportive of this, it makes sense to deploy resources uh, as best you can. People uh, generally accept uh, there is an element of armed police if they go to any airport in the country, they're used to seeing them, uh, and I think it's a welcome step. Thanks. Thanks very much, Councillor. Appreciate it. Councillor Davison. Thank you, Chairman. I think I broadly echo that. Um, but what I wanted to ask was, uh, uh, Clearly, this, this is a change, um, but I'm assuming that um, the, the officers in question wouldn't be uh, necessarily deployed to absolutely anything. Um, I wondered if you could maybe give us a, a, a notion of the sorts of things that, that, that they might be, I mean, obviously, without giving away anything sensitive, the sorts of, of, of calls that they might possibly be deployed to. Yes, they, they won't attend day-to-day -day routine low-priority calls that come in, such as shopliftings um, or uh, you know mi minor crimes or, or minor incidents. Um, what, what the Scottish Government have, have emphasised is that it should be emergency situations, threat to life incidents, um, that, that type of thing that they can be deployed to spontaneously or tasked to by the control room. And the other element is that I am now able to task them to local operations. So if we are, if we are running uh, a, a Christmas anti-violence campaign and we're looking for high visibility policing in certain areas, then I can I can deploy the officers to that if we're doing um, a road policing operation where we can we can stop vehicles we're doing stop checks we can deploy them to that uh, all of that has to actually still go through central tasking um, in order to actually assess whether their availability for the week in case there's other operations ongoing um, but that's that's a marked change because previously I wasn't able to do that but so you, so you are likely to see in the communities more overtly armed officers, but you, you won't see them turning up to the, to the routine day-to-day -day calls. Thank you. Councillor Bell. Thanks, Chair. Obviously, looking at, uh, looking at the European model, you know, in Spain, uh, they have the Garda Civile. Uh, they, are, they are always carrying uh, side arms, and uh, if you go over to France, I've been in Paris, uh, the, you know, the, the, the police officers are carrying side arms there. 
Uh, even in Glasgow Airport and Edinburgh Airport, you've got uh, local officers carrying firearms or resp uh, response units here. Is there ever going to be a, a, a need to increase uh, 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 through Police Scotland to, for police officers uh, to carry firearms in, in a more um, appropriate way? I say, you look at the, the European model, all the Guard of Seville, the French are carrying sidearms. I know in this United Kingdom or in Police Scotland we're not carrying. Ever, ever is going to be a need to um, all officers to carry firearms? Well, I hope not, um, because I, I think then is a, that would mean that um, the threat in society have increased to such an extent that uh, we need to take such a dramatic move. I, I hope um, I, I'd never live to see that eventuality. Um, we are an unarmed force, one of the few left remaining across across the world, and I, and I think that gives us a special relationship with our communities. And a, and a special level of consent, a unique level of consent in terms of how we do our policing. Um, that's something that's important for us to preserve as, as far as we can. Uh, I, I don't think that it's the same relationship between communities and the police services in France and Spain uh, or, or in other parts of the world. Um, so I think that's something that we should, we should cherish and try and hold on to for as long as we possibly can. I don't think the, the the threat necessitates every police officer being armed at the moment, thankfully. And as I said at the start, uh, to you right, right at uh, the start there, I hope it never actually comes to that. Councillor Charters. I, I, I make these remarks without any reflection on, uh, on, on you at all. I'd like to be quite understand that. But this time of uh, firearms uh, is, is a police-wide Scotland-wide initiative, supported, say, by most of uh, Police Scotland. But I also note that the, um, the, the head of armed police for Scotland, uh, Superintendent Kennell, and Chief Inspector Glass, who's the deputy head of armed police in Scotland, have both been suspended. Now, these are the people who are making decisions at the very top on how we should be armed. Um, and I must say, I'm, I'm, I'm rather amazed to find that our two top armed police have both been suspended. Well, um, for one of those individuals, um, he had been approaching the end of his career and in actual fact had been replaced at the top. So we'd still have a head of armed policing who was um, his replacement. Um, and... Uh, uh, the other thing I would say is, you know, we are a, a very large organisation with some excellent and highly skilled people at, at, within all our functions, and particularly in armed policing. So there's there's no power vacuum there. There's no loss of authority there. Um, there, there is cover for the people um, who are unfortunately um, being investigated and are under suspension at the moment. Um, and uh, I think there's going to be announcements today by Deputy Chief Constable Livingston as to how we're actually going to cover for, for the shortfall that we're experiencing just now. But I'd just like to reassure you, Councillor, that there is, there is no loss of authority or, or, or power vacuum under that. It's far too important a function for Police Scotland to, 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 to leave adrift like that. Councillor Lever. Just in your update, Gary, you said the, uh, the operating mo model is contrary to the way armed response officers are deployed in England and Wales. In, in what way is it different? Um, the armed police officers in England and Wales, my understanding is that they are more inclined to be able to, if, if they are armed and on patrol, the day-to-day -day incidents that we are not making that move for at the moment. So as, as I said to um, Councillor Davidson earlier, we are very much just trying to keep uh, a very tight control on what our armed officers go to, so it's it's not overt and in people's houses and day to day routine stuff. And I, and I think it's it's more overt in England and Wales than it is in Scotland at the moment. Thank you, Gary. Um, can I just ask a question? Um, the officers who will carry tasers, they're referred to as uh, special, specially trained officers. Um, now, the, the, the tasers um, can, in very rare occasions, prove fatal. Um, and I, uh, I wonder if you could tell us um, the, the the selection process for officers who will carry tasers. Are they volunteers? Are there the same um, 
selection processes or similar processes for taser officers as there are for um, authorised firearms officers? And will the like authorised firearms officers be subject to ongoing training and requalification? Um, yes, it will be on, on a voluntary basis. Um, I, I think uh, adverts for posts will probably be uh, begin out in the next few weeks, um, with a view to having uh, all the officers trained and deployed by by the middle of next year. Um, so, yeah, well, first of all, that selection process will come through the division. So, so the local supervisors and the local senior managers who know the officers will be asked to make comment on their suitability to actually carry. Uh, th this weapon, and that's very similar to what happens with the firearms officers as well. I don't know if the 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 same criteria, exactly the same criteria, will be used uh, in respect to taser than it will be for firearms, because it's they're very very different skills, and it's a very different skill set that's required to, to to operate them. But definitely, there will be a, a a very strict assessment process to ensure that the officers who do carry the tasers are appropriate and that training will, will definitely be ongoing. Thank you. No further questions? OK, thank you. We'll move on then. Um, I um, will now move on to scrutiny of the performance report. Gary, would you like to say a few words about the report before we open up to members' questions? Yes, thanks, Chair. Um, I don't want to go into, again, too much detail. I'd rather leave the time that we have uh, open for questions from yourself. Uh, I will, though, uh, just address some of the points that have been highlighted on the, the pre-brief here re regarding the, the performance. Um, w one thing that I, I would say is in item 3.11 there on the note, it says positive performance across the region for the comparable period has seen sexual crimes decrease from the same period by minus 6% and the detection rate has increased by 2.9%. So the increase in the detection rate is definitely a positive the decrease in the the the, the reporting uh, of sexual crimes, I don't actually see that as a positive. Um, we consider that sexual crimes and domestic abuse are probably the most underreported crime uh, in the in the country. And uh, and I've expressed to this committee previously that when we've seen increases in reporting of sexual crimes, that's actually a positive because we're trying. Uh, as, as much as we can to increase the level of reporting and increase the confidence of victims to come forward and report these crimes. So, um, so I, I was I was disappointed to see that fall actually, um, and we had a wee look at what we were, we were doing. If there was anything more that we could do round about that, um, and over the past few weeks we're begin, beginning to see what I would expect to see, which is a steady increase in the reporting of sexual crimes and domestic uh, abuse. Um, so I, I'm happy to call that just just a blip in the first six six months. Um, in respect to some of the other issues, there the incidents of disorder increased. Yes, mainly in the um, in the Stewartry area. Um, without getting into too much detail, we had a, a fair number of incidents that we could attribute to um, one group of people in a domestic setting, where we had a, a number of repeat calls because of that, and we've addressed that. Um, in respect of acquisitive crime, uh, yes, an increase again in acquisitive crime, but again, a big chunk of those crimes were attributed to some uh, counterfeit currency that was circulating in the, the division, not just in this division, actually, uh, across the whole southwest of Scotland. Um, and every, when there's, you would expect to see this type of rise when you've got counterfeit currency, because every time I know it's passed. It's uh, it's another crime, even if it's um, the same note, you know, for for three and three or four transactions. Um, we 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 did have a few detections for that, and again, um, that's tailed right off. I'm pleased to say, um, and the 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 positive there for me in in respect of domestic housebreakings is that we've remained steady for domestic housebreakings, which was a crime of concern for me. I think we're currently today sitting. At, perhaps one more than we had last year. Um, I don't like year-on-year -year comparisons anyway, but um, my, my feeling is that we're not seeing an increase in domestic house breakings, which is good. Um, hate crime, yeah, I, again, an increase in reporting in hate crime, so a drop in the detection rate is not something that's unexpected. Um, our detection rate remains high uh, compared to across the country, which I think is around about 60% for hate crime. 
And again, I'm, I'm happy to see that increase in reporting because, again, that, that reflects confidence in the community to come forward for these things. Um, and detection for drug supply and drugs cultivations. We kind of changed our focus this year. Um, and rather than going for low-level supply cases, we've tried to pitch our focus a bit higher uh, to, to try and take out some big, bigger players, and we've had some, some success in that. Um, but that's probably resulted in, a, in lower overall supply cases uh, being detected, but we'll keep chipping away at that. And mobile phone and speeding uh, offences, um, that's quite a significant drop for mobile phone offences. We, we did have, I think it's a combination of two things. Last year we had a number of mobile phone campaigns which we've not run this year. Um, so again, you're likely to see that because we've taken the focus away, the detections are likely to drop. Also, I think there's probably been a change in driver behaviour there um, to, to an extent. That is quite a big drop off, though, uh, and something that we're continuing to look at. So that's all I really wanted to highlight, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Gary. Any members got questions? Councillor Lever. Yeah, I agree with your uh, comment on year to year comparisons, particularly when you've got relatively small numbers of. Uh, uh, crimes, you can see a huge spike. But I still have the problem of actually assessing how well we're doing relative to other parts of Scotland. You know, we've got the figures here, but how do they compare to other areas? And I think we raised this uh, at the last committee meeting because, you know, if you uh, read the uh, the local newspapers, you know, it's just uh, one crime wave after the other sweeping through uh, Dumfries and Galloway. And I think that's painfully untrue, as everybody knows. We are a very safe region. But there's still a number of people within our um, communities who don't feel safe within their community. I think there was a report went to was it Policy and Resources fairly recently about how f safe people felt within their community, and a surprisingly large number of people didn't feel safe. So I think what we need to do is to have some way of reassuring people that we are a safe uh, area to, in which to live. And I think what we have to have is some sort of comparisons to what's happening elsewhere. I still don't necessarily agree, Councillor, with respect that this is the right, the right forum to compare with other places because, as I said the last time, it's, it's, apple, it's apples and oranges you're comparing. Um, we are a different community, we're a unique community. We are a low crime, high detection area and always have been. Um, and in Glasgow, where it's probably the opposite, you know, they could have a particular focus in a certain crime area, like, um, like for example, let's take for example, they might have had a focus in drug supply this year, so the drug supply cases go through the roof and, the, and you compare that to ours and it looks as if we are really, really underperforming when that's just not the case. You look to Edinburgh, who have a real problem with domestic housebreaking, so they have a massive focus on that and could have a far higher detection rate than we've got, but that doesn't necessarily, I don't think, reflect you know, what's happening out there in the community. So I don't know that this, I mean, it, it, if, if it's the wish of the committee that we actually do that, then it's something that we can look at. But I think in scrut scrutiny committees and scrutiny reports across the country, it's a very firm view that we should actually focus on our local performance and, you know, compare against ourselves and other places where, the, where the, the, they don't stand comparison. That said, there is plenty of data available um, online, you can access performance reports through the Police Scotland website of other areas. Um, the Scottish Government do their crime and justice surveys also, and they provide data from across the country, and that gives us comparisons. And I'm quite happy to speak about these comparisons at the committee, but I just don't know that I agree it's, uh, that this is the right place to actually present that data to be scrutinised. <laughs> I'm not talking about the detection rate, I'm talking about the number of incidents of these particular crimes. Um, and, okay, you could go online and find all this information, but the average person in the street or in the communities who feel threatened by it hasn't got that facility necessarily. So I do think we need to have some means of actually putting this into context in terms of how safe our communities are. Okay, I, I, I accept that, but I do think I do think I can bring that context. Like you're talking about crime incidents there, and and I've, and I've said here that we've got a, had a spike in in Group Three acquisitive crimes. But I can explain that. You know that that came because primarily we, we had something like sixty or seventy crimes all attributed to to counterfeit currency. Um, but if you compare the spike that we had here with 
Aberdeen or Dundee or Argyll or whatever that didn't experience that spike, then in actual fact, I think that would be counterproductive because then people would look at just the figures and say, well, they haven't had these spikes here, therefore, acquisitive crime, that means housebreaking, so we've got a crime spate down here, and that's, and that's just not the case at all. So I think it can work both ways. Councillor Stitt. Gary, on the road safety priorities, I think it's a good new story, but I'm quite disturbed at the number of fatalities on the road in a six-month period. Be any comments on that, or is it just due to speeding or? A few, yes, speeding in, in some cases, and I don't like to be frivolous about it, but actually, bad luck. Um, I think we had, we've had three multiple fatalities this year, so that's uh, one incident where there's been more than one death. Um, but what I should say is, in that six-month period, we had 12 fatalities, I think, in the first three months of the year, or the first four months of the year, and we haven't had any over the, over the, in the, the second half of this period whatsoever. So we had 11 by this time last year. We'll get 12 this, this time next year. I think at one point the comparison was 12 against 5. So it just shows you how erratic that, that actual figure can be. Um, and to be honest with you, sometimes it's just, it's just down to chance. Um, but yeah, the, the, um, the, the, the fatal accidents that we have had, there's, there's at least four which have been down to, to really, really poor driver behaviour. Um, so that's, but that's something that obviously remains a priority for us. Any further questions from members? No. Thank you. Um, so the recommendation that members scrutinise the performance reports of the Freeson Galloway Police Scotland for the period 1st April 2017 to 30th September 2017. We agreed to scrutinise the report. Okay, thank you. Uh, move on to item five. Consultation on the draft of Freeson Galloway Local Policing Plan 2017 to 2020. Uh, the report before us provides members with the draft Dumfries and Galloway uh, Local Policing Plan. This plan aligns Dumfries and Galloway Community Planning Partnerships Local Outcome Improvement Plan. Today we have an opportunity to provide comments and seek clarity from the local commander on the draft plan. Members' comments today will be collated along with comments received from the four area committees and a formal response agreed at full council on the 12th of December. Gary, would you like to speak to any specific points in the plan before we open up to discussion? Um, just a general point to me, and I'd just like to, to thank our, our partners at the Free and Galloway Council because I think this is probably the most collaborative policing plan that, uh, that I've ever, ever worked on, and, and I've worked on a, on a few. Um, the, tying our priorities into the light priorities was wasn't an easy task, um, and because it wasn't an easy task, I actually drawing up the light priorities, I understand that. Um, but I think we've managed to do that very effectively, and that was through the, the support that we received from from the council. So I really appreciate that, and it's important to acknowledge that. Um, I, I I commend this plan uh, to to the committee. I I think there's there's a really evidence base there for our, for our priorities. Uh, through your your view, councillor, user satisfaction survey and the the uh, enhanced local engagement that we've gone through recently with our, with our improved uh, community policing model. Um, so we've got an awful lot of feedback that's informed this plan uh, this year, and I'm, and I'm really pleased about that. Um, I think there's there's we we have laid out quite explicitly there uh, our indicators for success. Um, you'll see that there's, there's no targets there, uh, and, and again, I'm encouraged with that because I don't think targets tell us very much, and I, and I know that it's been the feeling of this committee in the past that that, that target-based approach was something that wasn't positive, um, and so I, I'm, I'm pleased to say that we, we don't have that, but what we certainly do is have a wide range of indicators that will actually demonstrate our success over the next three years. So I'd just like to commend the plan to the committee, and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, Gary. So we'll open up to members' questions. Councillor Bell. <coughs> Thanks, Chair. <coughs> Thanks, Chair. It's just a question for Gary. Obviously, social media, we had a report at the Nestle Area Committee uh, regarding your police, and police report and plan. 
Uh, it was interesting to see that the social media people were, you know, making comments on social media. You know, rep crimes were getting reported there. The number of people using it, and the number of people um, innings posted through Police Scotland or there's divisions on it, are picking up and reporting back to you. But one thing that's concerned me, obviously you're doing a great job there and it's, and it's working well and members of the public have seen it's working well and getting a good report there. One thing I'm still getting is a bit about 101, which is the call centre, people phoning up there. It's, slight, it's, getting, it's getting better, it's been a lot better than it was a couple of years ago and that. It's getting better, but it's how people report on crimes. When someone reports a crime to 101 and they want to speak to the community officer and try and get through to the community officer, I'm, I'm sorry the community officer's on a number of days leave. It's, it's taking, sometimes it's taking four or five days or three or four days for a member of public to be uh, uh, spoken to by a local police officer. So this needs to be tightened up because at the end of the day, people, don't, people have taken time to report a crime. They, they would like it followed up fairly quickly if that could be taken on board. No, definitely, Councillor. And, and it's, a, it's actually a real area of challenge for me and something that I've been trying to work on in, in my time here because our experience is that people sometimes want to report crimes to community officers and will wait a few days until they report it because they know their community officer and they would like to... And in actual fact, the community officer will go along three or four days later and that crime should have been should have been reported at the time and that individual should have got a service from us at the time. Um, and there's been a number of cases where we could have, had we had that report earlier, um, prevented further crimes. So, so that's why we ask everybody to go through the 101 system so that that assessment can be made uh, there and then. It does, however, throw up the problems that you, that you quite rightly say. And, and what we're trying to do is expand our social media operation, um, expand our ability. And we've already expanded our ability for people to contact us via email. Um, but I would, they're always going to get an answer when they phone 101. If I start putting out local police station numbers or local police, you know, they could be hanging on the phone waiting for, you know, they could be trying for four days before they even get an answer because the officers aren't sitting in there waiting, you know, they're out, they're out in the streets. So uh, I, 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 it's a really, really challenging area about that, about that method of contact. I think what we've got just now is probably is the, the best that we can hope for at the moment, but I'm still working in that and trying to find other ways for people to contact us directly and get the response that they, that they need. And I, and I say that quite specifically, the response that they need rather than the response that they want, because it's not always the same thing. Okay. Councillor Howie. Uh, Gary, Local Outcome 3, Health and Wellbeing. Uh, you're probably aware that all fire appliances carry defibrillators on them. Would you be supportive of police vehicles also carrying defibrillators? Yes, uh, um, I, I would be. Um, that's uh, a matter I can I can take away. But I think it's probably been getting considered nationally, councillor. But uh, no, that's um, it, it's probably just a, a, a matter of uh, funding and training. I suspect um, we do have we do have defibs at I think most of our stations in Dumfries and Galloway now. But uh, yeah, I would be supportive of that. Councillor Lever. Yeah, I think it is a, a very good uh, local policing plan. I think it very well illustrates the range of um, uh, assistance the, uh, the police force give to the community. It's not just about tackling crime, it's about uh, um, assisting the community right across the, uh, uh, the spectrum. And I think it does tie in very nicely with the, uh, the LOIP. Just in terms of um, the Police Scotland Youth Volunteers, which once again I think is uh, a good idea, a good way of getting young people involved in assisting their communities, I know it's a strand route. Is the intention to roll that across, out across the region, and also in terms of community resilience, special constables? We still have special constables, and it's the intention. Obviously, like the council, the police force is under a huge amount of uh, financial strain at the moment. Uh, by increasing the number of special constables, would that help with in terms of uh, community resilience? Um, Police Scotland Youth Volunteers first. Yes, uh, I actually gave an input to the group in Stranraer um, just just a couple of weeks ago, and, and they're a fantastic group of uh, 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 young people, and only about half of them are, are actually interested in careers in the police, and, and the, the, the others are there. In fact, they're all there actually just to, to contribute to the community and, and, and enjoy that uh, environment with, with their peers. Um, so, yes, and, and it's, a, it's a very uh, easy answer for me. Yes, I would like to have a group in Dumfries. The group that's in Stranraer actually service 
the whole of the region at the moment. So they're involved in events that were at Youth Beats last year, for example, um, that, that was based up here. So they are involved in events all over the region. But um, of course, we have the training down there, the training nights are there, so that so all the, the kids that go there are from that area. Um, so it's my intention to, to launch another group <laughs> in Dumfries uh, next year um, as part of a wider youth engagement strategy that we're looking to develop in, in the region, which will involve our schools-based officers, um, some of our community officers, and as I say, hopefully establishing a, a PSYV team in Dumfries. Um, as for special constables, yes, they're a, a, an actual fact, a, a huge part of our uh, resourcing model, especially in our, in our more remote locations. Um, I think we recruited six last year in total. I, I, we, we did some towards the end of, end of the, um, the previous year. Um, what we've actually done there is, is changed the training model because that was a, an obstacle to, to special constables coming in because they had to do a week's training or a cumulative week's training, but they had to do it at the Scottish Police College. Um, that was a national development to try and standardise the training for, for special constables. And we were finding that we were having a lot of interest from people in the community in becoming specials, um, but that, that was just impossible for them to, to um, commit a week uh, at Stirling. So um, so last year, we, we were um, the, the first to pilot this in, in Scotland. We ran a local course, which was just a, a satellite course from Stirling, and that allowed us to recruit more. And that's something that's going to be rolled out across the country actually next year. So, so I'm hoping that we'll still manage to, to recruit um, a good few special constables because we definitely need them. Councillor Charteris. Um, in, in this um, document, I'm uh, looking at page 35 actually, which is the local scrutiny and engagement, um, where it says, um, the Scottish Police Authority was established to maintain policing, promote policing principles and continuous improvement of policing and to hold the Chief Constable to account. Of course, that can't happen now because we don't have a Chief Constable. Um, and it goes further on in the paragraph to say that the, the, the responsibilities of the uh, Scottish Police Authority in policing throughout Scotland and Dumfries and Galloway Division has a close working relationship with the Scottish Police Authority and accounts formally by report. Well, you can't do that either now because there's no there's nobody at the top of the SPA. It, it's part of the, um, the this pattern which I'm bringing out that the 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 the, the, the Scottish Police Authority and the and the police themselves um, are losing all their head people by investigation or retirement or stepping down, the different words for it. But it does seem to me that there, there is some sort of, sort of cultural problem going on here at the, at the heart of the, the police in Scotland. And you, you can't lose this number of people, very, very senior people, vital to our reporting and our local scrutiny engagement, when we can't do it because we don't, we don't have such people there. And it goes on. I mean, I can, you, you, I'm sure you're well aware as I am. But there's a lot of very senior positions unfilled at the moment while people are being investigated, including in the SPA and, and the police authority. Uh, Gary, just, just before you answer that question, I think it, it's important to, to note that um, Ian Livingston, the Deputy Chief Constable, has taken on the role of the Chief Constable, um, Phil Gormley, and I believe that um, Susan Deacon has been appointed as the the chair of the SPA, albeit she hasn't taken up that post yet. But Gary, do you want to make any comments on that? Um, yes, I would. I, I, I think it would obviously be disingenuous in me, councillor, to you know just to gloss over that um, and, and the, the points that you make. It's clearly a, diff a difficult time organisationally for, for for Police Scotland. But uh, as as the chair says, these things are these things are getting sorted out, and uh, and we do have leadership in the force. Um, but I think the, the the one positive that comes out of this for me is that I'm here to speak about local policing and policing in Dumfries and Galloway. And despite the fact that there's been there's been troubles at at the top end of the post, policing day to day in Dumfries and Galloway remains unaffected. Um, and that's because one of the strengths of Police Scotland is that we've got the authority for local policing in the right place in the hands of local policing commanders. So I control 
local police in Dumfries and Galloway, and I'm still here. So I can assure you that um, policing in this region will continue to be delivered to the very high standard that it has been over the past three years. Any further questions from members? Councillor Bell? No. Gary, thanks for that. Um, in terms of recommendation, members asked to provide comments on the draft Dumfries and Galloway local policing plan <coughs> to be included in the draft response to be considered by full council on 12th December. I agree that's happened. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, moving on to item six, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, Dumfries and Galloway local plan, six month performance update, 1st of April, 2017 to 30th September 2017. Um, we have a performance report from Fire and Rescue Service. Members will note the covering report provides an overview of improving and declining performance. Hamish McGee, local senior officer, is here today to answer questions on the report. Hamish, would you like to speak on any points in the report before we ask for members' questions? Thanks, Chair. Yes, uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to say a few things. Uh, good morning, members. Um, you see before you the performance report for the first two quarters of the year, uh, covering our activity from April to the end of September. In general, uh, I believe this to be a very strong performance and demonstrates the continued efforts both by Fire and Rescue Service, but also other partner agencies in making our communities safer. Uh, as always, the report provides the commentary to the performance, but if you don't mind, I'll just make a few comments in certain areas. Uh, in terms of the deliberate fires, after a slight increase in the first quarter, we've seen a significant improvement in quarter two. Uh, the primary reason for that initial increase, is, as you'll recall, was we had a little bit of an issue at um, Gates at Heath Hall, the old um, factory industrial complex. Um, this resulted in a multi-agency response locally, which I'm pleased to say eradicated that um, issue. And as you've seen, that's been, as a result, uh, another great example of how the partnership uh, working we have locally has had a significant impact. Uh, members will also recall that we experienced a rise in deliberate fires, uh, and that was reported at the last meeting. Uh, we had a resultant focus in a media campaign, which um, our performance figures, I believe, now indicate there's been a positive response to this. And we've seen a 20% reduction on the same period last year and a 50% reduction between quarters one and two. There's also been a 32% reduction in accidental dwelling fires from the previous reporting period. And this is the second lowest recorded over the last five years. Uh, the reporting period also saw a reduction in our attendance at road traffic collisions. Um, and although, you know, within the, the Police Scotland report, they talked about an increase in fatalities, the actual, in, the actual numbers of road traffic collisions and the resultant injuries from it has vastly reduced. And again, I'd like to say, I, I believe that this is a result of the close working relationship we have uh, locally and the road safety partnership. Um, the wider special service casualty data you'll note continues to demonstrate the services activities in support and other agencies. Uh, and the more diverse skill sets that firefighters are being asked to deploy in. I'll talk a little bit more about that later within our presentation. Uh, and notably within this period, the water rescue capability based in Dumfries came online, uh, which already been deployed and I am aware of at least on one occasion where we saved a life in the River Nith. So I think it's a very positive move um, that we have uh, managed to put in place. Our UFAS activity is now seeing an overall reduction uh, but again, as previously indicated and discussed in this forum, uh, there are two parts to that story. Uh, there is the aspect, or the very positive aspect, of the, the increased number of smoke detectors that we're fitting, and obviously we respond to those, so that's part of it. But also the remaining attributed to the relevant premises alarms, like sleeping accommodation, uh, schools, etc. Uh, and we will now be continuing to provide you with a breakdown of that within the commentary of the performance report as you see it today. Tragically, uh, I have to report that we had four deaths as attributed to fire within the area in the first six months of the year. Um, the context is, is contained within the report. Um, in general, three deaths were attributed to circumstances other than a house fire. Uh, one is too many. 
all we said is we will continue to strive to achieve zero deaths. Uh, and as I say, very tragic that, that um, these circumstances have happened. Uh, can I just conclude with my uh, preamble with just one part that's not within that performance report, and I think it might just interest members. Uh, we recently had bonfire night, or as I should, would like to say bonfire weekend, because it is the three weekends, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I think you need to take that within the context of, of um, our performance. But I'm very happy to report that our performance has remained static from the last two years. We had 15 incidents over those three nights, 10 on bonfire night, no attacks on firefighters, and uh, I would again commend the excellent work of the multi-agency working group that's been set up uh, that deals with the lead up to bonfire night and makes it such a success and such a safe uh, weekend. So again, very positive um, uh, performance to report to you. I'll pause at that and I'll, I'll allow you now, if you would, uh, to consider the report and ask any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Hamish. Any questions from members? Councillor Bell and then Councillor Charters. Thanks, Chair. I'm delighted to see that uh, I listened to the, the full report here. Obviously, uh, talking about RTCs and that, obviously there's been a drop in the last six months. I certainly welcome that. Uh, looking, at, looking at your performance figures there in 2015 and 2016, it seems to be um, the months of February and March are they seem to be fairly high. Uh, obviously mentioned that you're, you're working with the Road Safety Partnership and it's playing a role in obviously safer roads and less, less accidents. Isn't it also down to weather conditions as well? If you'll take back a number of years, you haven't got the, the 2011, 2012 with an imminent hard frost for a period of time. You had a lot of accidents then. I know in the last couple of, this morning there was a bit of frost. So obviously that'll account for a lot of accidents or, 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 or don't you really focus that? Really focus on the whole, the whole year? Um, we actually, as a, uh, a partnership, which I chair, um, we look at the whole aspect of it. So we actually have the roads agencies that sit within that partnership as well. So in some ways, what I would say is we learn from the previous figures. So those areas that you've talked about, the, the months that you've talked about, those are the areas that you know our partners will focus on now about gritting. The other one, I think, um, that has come on an awful lot more is the social media aspect, particularly uh, through our colleagues in Police Scotland. You know, you'll get that warn and inform in the morning. Somebody else will be aware that tomorrow morning you're going to, it's going to be a very severe frost. So I think people being aware of the conditions and then you know changing their driving habits to suit those conditions, I think, has been a you know something that we've learned and implemented over the years. Council okay, so Charters. Um, um, in, in this report. Uh, uh, Mr. McGee, uh, I'm looking at paragraph 3.3, where um, it says you will provide members with a presentation of doing... Oh, I'm ahead of myself. I shall wait until the next one comes up. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any further members' questions on this particular item? No, nope. thank you. You got off quite lightly there, Hamish. Um, so, um, the members asked to scrutinise the performance report for Dumfries and Galloway uh, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, 1st of April 2017 to 30th September 2017. We'll now move on to item 7, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service Service Transformation. This is the one that Councillor Charters, I think, was referring to. Report by Director of Communities. Members will be aware that the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service is undergoing service transformation. The local senior officer, Hamish McGee, will now provide members with a short presentation. Thank you, Hamish. Thanks, Hamish. And can I apologise for the, the failure of our audio systems, but you did very well. Um, do you want to return to your seat and we'll, we'll start questions? Okay, thanks, Amy. That was very interesting and very comprehensive, but I'll now open up to members' questions. Councillor Charteris? Right page. Um, I, I was interested in the six topics which are listed, which are, uh, of which I have no um, uh, quarrel with at all, except for the second one, which says refining our station footprint. Now, I know what refining station footprint means. It means reducing the number of stations. It always does when you refine footprints. 
And I think that would prove to be very unpopular in this very large rural area where it takes quite a long time for your appliances to get into the rural areas anyhow. And if we start reducing the number of uh, places where fire appliances are kept, I think it would uh, give a worse service, not a better one. Uh, can I start by saying that, um, first of all, no decisions have been taken on anything. This is all about, as I said, an early conversation. Um, the second uh, part I would also say to you is that part of the presentation talked about that the fire and rescue service as it stands right now is a model that was developed from 1940s. And the current fire stations are in the same places as they were in 1940. Um, this is a national uh, transition or transformation agenda and obviously all local context needs to be taken into account all of that work is yet to be done um, as a local senior officer for Dumfries and Galloway um, I would share your concerns uh, but from my perspective is that the model that we have within this area right now absolutely supports the agenda that we are trying to achieve we are here to support partners we're here to uh, to become more integrated within that partnership working and to deliver against things like health and social care, uh, to, to protect communities from flooding, from other environmental, environmental impacts. So, you know, those are the sort of conversations that we will be having. I would certainly feed back any concerns that you had, but as I say, there are, there are nothing, there is nothing on the table and there are no discussions um, have been taking place yet on that side and there are no proposals in terms of reduction of of it, but it is right and proper that we should look at the stations we have across nationally and see if they're still in the right places and are still fit for purpose. Thank you, Hamish. Councillor Howie. Uh, just historically, there was always a bit of resistance from the ambulance service of the fire service moving in uh, to matters of dealing with casualties at all. Are the ambulance service fully supportive of your proposals? Uh, yes, they are, because it is a part of a national campaign. It's been uh, directed and led at a national level. Uh, the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest to this date have been trials, but there have been trials that have been done uh, absolutely with the support of the Scottish Ambulance Service. In fact, they do a lot of the training. Um, currently, those uh, trials are suspended um, because of other negotiations that are currently going on nationally. Um, but yes, everything would be done in terms of, of their support and um, they, at this point in time, we don't have a problem with it. In fact, as I've shown you within the performance reports, we are being called upon by the ambulance service more and more to assist them with a number of incidents, particularly around about gaining access um, to premises. They, they regularly now are uh, asking us to come out and open doors. Thanks, Hamish. Councillor Davison. Yeah, thanks, um, Chairman. Um, I particularly welcome the, um, the focus on uh, hospital cardiac arrest, but that's a personal interest. I'll leave that to one side. I, I, at the moment, I do think it's a good idea. Um, I, and I think that the, the presentation that, you, that you've given, I mean, if anybody looking at that will say that makes a lot of sense. It's, it's, it's a logical thing to do. Um, it, it, it reflects, I guess, things and approaches that are basically being taken across um, the public sector. Um, the tricky bit, of course, is when it gets into the specifics, because it, it, it's one thing to, um, to agree that the, the, the outline is, is a good one, and I think it is. It's always more difficult when it gets down to what it means um, locally, um, and particularly if that involves changes. I mean, it's worth, I, I guess, reflecting on um, what happened with Police Scotland. I mean, we ended up in a situation where politically um, everybody, uh, well, every political party, I think almost almost all political parties, supported the creation of Police Scotland. Um, but then, of course, as soon as changes started happening on the ground, um, it became an entirely different matter. I mean, some of that was legitimate, some of it wasn't, let's face it, but um, nevertheless, that's what happened. I guess bearing in mind that this is always the danger with something that will be a big change that goes from a concept everyone likes the sound of to changes which may be uh, much more much more difficult i think at, at what point 
um, is it envisaged that the more practical application of the big overall picture is going to start being, I, I guess, worked through in a way that people can have a look at and see what they think about? And, and I guess um, partners as well, and community planning partners, for example, um, and you know when when they'll start to be able to look at the more the more practical aspects of it, because I think that's probably where the most debate. In fact, it is certainly where the most debate about this is likely to be. The well, hopefully, the way in which the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service has done its business to this point, you would agree, is that we engage, we listen, and then we come back with proposals. And we go into a consultation phase, we listen, and the consultation phase is then, you know, we agree and then we implement. And I, I believe locally that is exactly what we've done. Um, in terms of the timing of when the consultation will come out, as I said in the presentation, it talks about in early next year. Um, I don't like putting uh, someone on the spot, but yeah, there is a, a board member uh, who may well be able to. Uh, provide a little more clarity on that situation. I'm not sure. Kirsty, do you want to say something now? Or? Quite happy to yes, please, please. Thank you. It's uh, musical chairs this morning. It is uh, right. it is uh, right. So you're Dr. Kirsty Darwin, yes. and you're the chair designate. Yes, I, of I start the on the 11th of December, so not quite in role. So I'm, I'm here even before I'm in post. Um, no, our intention is to begin the consultation process in January, but this isn't going to be a, a quick bang and, and finish. You know, this is going to be an extended transformation over a number of years. So we're not going to be coming with fait accompli's and you know, immediate solutions and, and radical changes which will all be done rapidly because what we need to do is think this through with communities to consult, to make sure that the changes that we're making are going to be properly embedded. So, you know, out of, heart, out of hospital cardiac arrest, for example, being rolled out across Scotland isn't going to happen immediately. It needs proper training and support. Firefighters need that. Local communities need that. Um, equally, if we're thinking about supporting the, the RDS, um, so it becomes more sustainable in the long term. And I'm pleased to hear that it's not such an issue in Dumfries and Galloway's, but certainly in, in the Highlands and Islands it is. We'll need to change the way that we support those services, and that will also take time. And in parallel with that, we also need to renegotiate terms and conditions with our employees and through unions and negotiation, and that takes time. So the likelihood is this will be an ongoing process of change we will be repeatedly coming to you to talk about these changes over the next four years as we fully implement them. So the first consultation will be in the new year, but actually we'll be continuing to consult with you as we as we change and evolve. Thank you, Kirsty. Um, Councillor Lever. Yeah. <coughs> you say uh, more agile enabling services required to support frontline. What, what sort of thing you're talking about? Is that more? joint working with the police and uh, NHS in terms of uh, uh, sharing back, uh, backroom uh, support staff. And in terms of the health and social care, over time, I mean, I know you uh, do the cardiac arrest uh, in, in part, but could you see that being expanded to more of a sort of first responder type role, a uh, paramed paramedical uh, role generally across the, uh, uh, the service? In terms of working with other partners locally, you know, th that is a conversation. Uh, I have to be honest, it's, it's not, it depends on what other you need us to do type thing um, and whether we have the capacity and the ability to do that. Um, some of the things that uh, we're already exploring is about, you know, that in, could it be a fire and rescue service person that goes in when someone comes out of hospital and they do an assessment of the needs of an individual when they go back into the home? We're very good at risk assessment. Um, so we would then signpost uh, other agencies as to what needs to come in to provide that support package for an individual. Uh, so that's us doing a job that someone else has then been released to go and do something else. So that's the sort of thing we're talking about. In terms of your, you know, um, your views around about uh, sharing back office with other emergency services, um, th that isn't per se part of this transformation agenda. But that is an ongoing conversation that we are having. We, we sit at a national level where the three services discuss 
how they may work better together. Um, and you, you're aware that you know Police Scotland have asked for some of our premises locally whether we could support Police Scotland working out of a fire station. And, and yes, that is progressing. We've also had the same conversations with the ambulance service. So that's an ongoing um, uh, discussion. And sorry, I've forgotten the second part. Oops. The idea of uh, sort of extending the uh, the cardiac work into more of a, a paramedical sort of first responder type role. I, I believe that we need to walk before we can run. Um, and I think, again, that's, you know, we're, we're working with other colleagues and the other services, and we need to understand that relationship between us and make sure that, you know, we're not taking on someone else's role. This is all about working in partnership for the better, uh, betterment of our communities. In terms of a first responder, uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest pilots, we were the first responder, although the ambulance service were backing us up. So it's where the ambulance service couldn't make it within a certain response time, the nearest fire and rescue uh, appliance was mobilized and then the ambulance came in and it, and it proved quite effective. And uh, the, the figures, I, I don't know exactly, but I believe it's around 40 odd people are alive today because of a fire and rescue service response out in these out of hospital cardiac arrest um, trials. So I think it's worthy of it. And it's again, as I said earlier about positive outcomes, give me it, please. I would take out of hospital cardiac arrest in Dumfries and Galloway tomorrow. I shall leave it. I was just thinking of the case where you've got an elderly person who falls in the home, they aren't seriously injured, but the problem is they can't get up again and their partner can't get them up either. Um, so it's a question of getting them on their feet effectively and just giving them a quick check over to make sure that the, you know, there isn't any need for um, um, the medical services to come in. All they needed to do was get off the floor effectively. I absolutely support that. And that's you know where the model needs to be looked at. It depends on the, you know, the, the response that we actually provide. Is it an appliance with six people in it? Is it a smaller appliance with two people in it or three people in it? And the other thing I think is key uh, to all of this moving forward is it's about, particularly in the RDS situation, it's about local people responding to the people they know in their local community and looking after them. And I think that's, you know, for me, that's an, an arena that we need to expand on. Thank you. Um, Kirsty, since you're in the hot seat, uh, could I just seek a clarification from you? Um, you spoke about um, the challenges in the Highlands in relation to retained firefighters um, and that perhaps in Dumfries and Galloway the situation isn't, isn't the same. I don't know who was the first person to say it, but uh, if it ain't broke, it don't need fixing. But what I'm, I'm, I'm getting at here is, is it feasible that you could have a different model in place in the Highlands and that the, the the current model that's used here in Dumfries and Galloway could remain the same, or are you looking at this from a purely national perspective that uh, the, the, the retained system would change right across the country? From your experience with us, we wouldn't be thinking of grand national solutions and then imposing them from the top down. This is about shoring up and supporting what's already working and further supporting areas where there are challenges. So in the last um, three or four years, we, we've recruited 268 additional members to our RDS. So our RDS is strengthening. We know that in some areas it is working. There are probably areas where the retained service would be wanting to do more. So we would be looking to support and enhance that. We wouldn't be looking to take away from a system that was already working. And we would absolutely be doing that in partnership. But as you say, if we're going to be thinking about, for example, falls prevention and falls intervention, we wouldn't necessarily be wanting the same on-call type system that we currently have here. We might well want to enhance that to more people during the day. We, we don't quite know yet, but we would feel our way through that with you. Thanks, Kirsty. I think that the, you know communities right across Dumfries and Galloway would, would welcome that, that commitment. Um, and Hamish, do you want to come in? If, if you don't mind, just to, to add to that, I, I don't think it's even an area to an area. I think it's a station to a station. So it, it all depends on what the community requires and, and, the, and the particular uh, circumstances of that station at that time, because things change constantly. You know, we, we're always recruiting and, and uh, 
Uh, as I've always said to you, there are challenges within every station at a certain point because people will retire and it takes time to get them up to speed. And there has to be some form of resilience built into that and the flexibility that a slight change in the model would provide me locally as the, you know, the local senior officer. Again, I'd welcome that. Okay, thanks, Hamish. Uh, any further questions from members? Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll move on to item eight. Um, there are no uh, further matters deemed urgent, um, and I will now close the meeting. Um, I would like to invite Ella and Kirsty to join us in the members' lounge for refreshments and uh, have the opportunity to meet and chat further with members. Thank you very much.